we will start the next lecture uh, that will be about molecular clouds and start formation of the Milky Way by uh, Frederick Mott. So, hello everybody, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are living. Uh, so, I've been asked to present you uh, something about molecular clouds in the Milky Way. Since for me, molecular clouds are tightly associated to star formation, I will also talk about star formation, but not much, I should say. Um, so uh, I'm going to organize my lecture around a few directions, and, and they are written here in the title. What are molecular clouds? Where they are in the Milky Way? How do they form? What are their properties? Especially statistical properties are important for the clouds. And how do they form stars, if you find me? Um, since uh, we are working with Zoom these days, uh, I'd like the, um, this presentation to be as interactive as we can. So I've made some break here and there, asking you to ask questions about the subparts of my lecture. And uh, I've been told that I'm going to give a coffee a, a talk just after that for people that want to ask even more questions. So I'll be completely open to all that. On this first slide, you see lots of uh, logos. These are the main uh, uh, surveys I've been involved and in. I've been leading actually with Herschel, with uh, uh, the IRAM 30 meter and with ALMA. And uh, the grants that we are really uh, needing when we are doing some research these days, and you'll see in your future that you are always chasing money to be able to perform your task in your different uh, surveys. So I'm going to try to make something a bit different from others, I think. Mm -hmm. I decided to, if I manage, no. OK, I decided to present myself like, uh, like a normal person so that you really know where I come from and uh, so that you can ask on, not only questions about the research, but about the research path as well, because I think these schools are also per pretty important for you to know how to deal with your research future and ask the good person that, that have been in some places about some information uh, to help you through. So in practice, uh, I did my PhD. Sorry, maybe you see that. Uh oh, I lost my mouse. We did. Do you want to stop sharing and ah, share again? It's fine. No, no, it's fine. Ah, yes, okay. we see it now. Manage. Sorry about that. So um, uh, I did my PhD in C.A. Sackley in 98. Then I made uh, three postdocs, one at Max Planck Bonn in Germany, another one at Caltech in Pasadena, California, and then another one at Paris Sackley. I ended up getting a permanent position as a senior researcher, which means that I'm not teaching a lot I'm mostly making research and evaluating grants and so on. And uh, I've been uh, lucky enough to be surrounded by good young people supervising four PhD students and four postdocs. They were coming for, from broad, uh, broad ranges from Vietnam to Australia, Canada and, and more about uh, Europe. Uh, and as for a personal note, I'm turning 50 this year and I have three children and I managed to do some research at the same time. So I think it's important to say it because it's not always uh, thought to be feasible. So now as for my expertise, I'm working mostly on star formation, especially on the earliest phases of IMA stars. I'm not doing, going to talk about much about that today. And I've been doing some work on cloud and star cluster formations that's more related to the lecture today. Uh, as for the observatories I've been using, I've been using a lot the Herschel satellite from ESA, uh, the IRAM 30 meter and NOEMA uh, facilities, and as well as uh, the old uh, Caltech Center Observatory, which was actually uh, led by uh, Tom Phillips in, in California at the time I was postdoc there. And of course, ALMA. Okay, now let's move on for my collaborative experience because I think it's also important for, for you to understand that uh, we can do research in small groups. People ask that you increase your microphone volume. Can you do that? I'm afraid I cannot do much about that. I'm going to speak a bit louder. Okay? okay. 
So uh, I've been doing some uh, work in small groups at the beginning of my career, and then I end up uh, working in very large collaborative uh, groups, consortia of up to 100 people. So that's different. And that's the way uh, our uh, science is functioning now. You have times where you are working between a few people and times where you're working with hundreds of persons and even leading this kind of uh, consortia. So you have to deal with that. And I've been lucky enough to work with um, theoreticians and emulsions. So to, uh, I was able to compare uh, my uh, observation to models. And that's very important when you want to understand the physics behind all these surveys that you are doing. OK. Now, the outline of my lecture is uh, shared into five uh, different topics, five parts. And after each of these parts, I'm going to give you a break to, to ask questions. So I know that you cannot speak up, up, so please write them down in the Slack. I won't be able to see them easily, but I think uh, one of the, uh, the, the chair is going to read them to me in that case. And that's important for you to really understand uh, all the topics I'm going to cover because there are many. And I think that's important to, to, to go through all these topics to present the molecular clouds. But I cannot go deeply into uh, the topics. So if you have questions and you want to understand things, it's the time to ask questions. Uh, the topics that I'm going to overlook underlook completely are the topics around B field. And Francois Boulanger is doing, going to talk about a lot about feedback and I think Eric Koch and uh, Eve uh, uh, Schreiker is going to uh, discuss that about star formation rate you've heard already about it uh, through for example the presentation of David Elbaz so this I won't be able to talk about today so now um, the, the, the clouds are in fact part of the intestinal matter and there are different phases I think you already saw that with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, David yesterday so the Milky Way consists of a lot of 10 to the 11 stars. And if you look at the mass in these stars, it's a lot compared to the, the ISN, only 5% for the ISN, which means that we are dealing with a minor portion of the mass of the visible uh, uh, component of the Milky Way. And uh, we are going even further when we are tracing it, because we are using traces which are very minor. Uh, it's mostly constituted of hydrogen, uh, the clouds, but, but when you are looking at uh, molecular uh, clouds, you're basically using the CO, so it means that you are around 1% of the elemental abundance, and it's the same for the dust, which is the second main tracer. But even with that, we managed to do a lot of things and uh, have interesting uh, input for the, for the physics of these uh, objects. Uh, there is a sharp transition between the H1, which is a neutral atomic uh, H, uh, hydrogen, to the H2, which is a molecular hydrogen. And it goes at very low density and high temperature. And then when you enter the cloud, it gets denser and denser, colder and colder. And, and uh, well, I've put here a few uh, different uh, structures like diffuse clouds, molecular clouds, and the cores, which are these star progenitors I've been working a lot, a lot on. And as you can see, as density increases a lot, temperature is decreasing as well. So uh, I would like also to say that as there is a very rich chemistry in these uh, clouds. I'm not going to present a lot about that, but it's because uh, you are dealing with long lifetime structures, uh, low density gas, uh, chemistry which can go, uh, which can make complex on, on the grain surface and with very varying environment with temperature, cosmic rays and a lot of thing, ionization and so on. Uh, oh yeah, and I didn't say, uh, you have to keep in mind that the clouds are really li like Russian dolls. That's something important because it's not only the clouds from H1 to, to H2 which is doing that, but also when you go to the structure of, of the cloud that you have Russian dolls. Now, uh, clouds are tightly associated with stars. Here there is a sketch going from the Nova universe to galaxies and then to molecular clouds. And you see that here in this cycle, you really have a tight connection between the clouds and the star clusters which are forming and which are uh, then uh, having some stellar feedback on the cloud through some outflows, through supernovae, through ionization and so on. So it, it's 
a single uh, entity that you are studying when you are looking at uh, molecular cloud and star forming clouds. Um, stars are very important ingredient for the galaxy and, and because, uh, for example, I here mentioning two notions which are really crucial, the initial mass function of stars and the star formation efficiency. For now, we have the impression that uh, the IMF is universal, that the star, for, star formation efficiency is pretty low everywhere, but it, in fact it's not so sure and we really have to study both the cloud and the stars which are forming this cloud to understand this very important notion for the cosmology as well as the nearby galaxies as well as even planets forming around, the, uh, around stars. Okay, now what are the traces of, of clouds? Here I'm presenting a um, CO map of Deimita a long time ago already and uh, it shows that, uh, that you really manage to, to get access to the galactic plane and separate clouds, especially those that are pretty nearby, which separate from the, the outskirts. Here you have Taurus, if you are Orion. And you have uh, IRAS uh, presented here, mini-fred uh, emission, which is showing you more the heating of stars and especially OB stars on the cloud. So you achieve Orion, for example, Perseus, but here it's more difficult to, to really differentiate the regions. So here just locates the uh, nearby uh, clouds, which are presented here at higher latitude. There are others here. And uh, there was a really a, a, a renewal when Herschel came on board because we were able to have not only a higher angular resolution observation in the far infrared, like was IRAS, but we managed also to have at the same time the submillimeter range. And the submillimeter range is tracing cloud. So with the same uh, observatories with similar angular resolution, you get access to both the cloud component and the young star component. And here you can see uh, two regions I'm going to discuss a bit later, which are Cygnus X and W43, which are very important uh, region to, to, to understand the, the structure of the Milky Way. And you have the galactic center here. So we were at 100 to 500 parsec for the nearby clouds. Here we are jumping to up to 8 kiloparsec for the galactic center. Now, uh, what is spectral energy distribution of the cloud? Here it's not the cloud, it's really one of the core, one protocellar core. The cloud it has a spectral energy distribution, which is the sum of all its components. So if you add up diffuse clouds, hot components, uh, ionized regions, and so on, you're going to have a very complex uh, spectral energy distribution. When you focus on the coldest regions, like this one, for example, it's rather simple. You have uh, some kind of a gray body here, plus some heated component there. And what you see is that Herschel is perfectly suited to really look at the peak of a spectral energy distribution of these sources, which are 10 to 15K, uh, 50K sorry, uh, in temperature. And uh, our uh, radio telescope and an interferometer are well suited to look at the simulator part here which is important as well, but, but which needs to be more sensitive for, than Herschel because we are not uh, exactly at the peak. And then you have Spitzer and JWST, which is aiming at uh, trace this stellar component, young star component at the very center and H2 regions. Now, um, thanks to uh, thermal dust emission of clouds being mostly optically thin in, uh, in the wavelengths larger than 100 micron, we managed to have some accurate uh, column density and mass measurements. That's very important to get access to the gas reservoir, which is within cloud and which is associated with star formation. We use a simple uh, gray body model and uh, well, black modif uh, modified black body model, actually, with a very simple dust opacity to trace the, the cold component of what I've seen, I've showed you before. And we have a simple relation between the optically thin uh, mass of the cloud and its integrated flux that you are measuring. The distance, uh, the dust opacity per unit mass and column density, and the Planck function. So these are simple equations that we are using all the time when we want to get access to the mass of our gas reservoir, let's say. These are images of Herschel that, you, that we've made uh, as part of the Hobbes uh, large program. 
as you can see, uh, there are uh, lots of structures. And uh, as I was saying you before, the reddish component is a 250 micron, and it's uh, mainly focused on dense clouds. So you have with yellow and reddish structures all the cold carbons of the clouds. And you have in the bluish part, 70 micron, the impact uh, of the OB stars on the diffuse clouds around H2 region, let's say. So you have here two examples of H2 region which are impacting the cloud. The, the strength of Herschel was that we had a large dynamics in, in special scale. Here we are dealing with 100 parsec structures and we can go to below 0.1 parsec structures. And uh, we have also a very large dynamic in column density or mass, depending what you what you want to measure. So you have a strong difference of uh, column density between this area and this one, which is helping a lot uh, the structure uh, studies uh, that we are making. Now uh, let's go to part uh, to the summary of part one. What I showed you is that. Uh, Clouds and cloud structures can be seen like Russian dolls, and they, they go, the densest are generally the coldest. Uh, that molecular clouds are traced by CO and dust generally, and Herschel is helping a lot by making the direct link between clouds and stars with the same uh, observatories. So I'm going to stop here for a few minutes. If you want to ask questions, please do so. No, I don't think there are questions for now. I think you can go on. It was probably too simple for the beginning. Okay. But uh, don't, uh, don't be there are shy. People, there are people typing. Okay. So we're going to wait a bit. Don't be shy, but because that's important to, to better understand things right now, because afterwards you're going to forget what I said. Can I have a look myself? No, well, yes, if you want. Uh, why? Uh, so, why long lifetimes and the low density mean uh, rich chemistry? Uh, you, you manage to have a very different, uh, really, uh, let's say, a reaction. Uh, for long lifetime means that you, you're going to have uh, things that are, well, maybe it's, it's, it was not a good. Uh, arguments. But when you have a uh, low density, you, you manage to get some molecules that are, for example, in, uh, in the ground, in, our, in the earth, completely destroyed right away because of density. And here they remain for long, uh, uh, like radical, for example. And uh, that makes, uh, these are make, this is interesting, first of all, for, for chemistry reason. And then it, it, there are different traces of different uh, medium in a way. Um, so Elena is saying that uh, she's assuming, well, we all assume that uh, we are in optically thin conditions when dealing with molecular clouds, and, uh, but I don't think it's completely true. What do you think about it? So uh, indeed, that's not completely true in the very densest part of dense cores. For the massive dense cores, we are obliged to do some correction for the opacity of the dust at one millimeter. And when you go to two millimeter, it's even uh, it's more, more complex to get the, the to get optically thin. For Herschel, the beam was so large that it was optically thin for, for all medium we were tracing. So wh why temperature of clouds uh, decrease with increasing density? They are self-shielding themselves. The heating is coming from the stars, from outside, and uh, the dust and H2 actually is shielding uh, uh, the, the gas uh, from the heating from outside, and uh, simply the, the temperature is decreasing. So is there any reasons to believe that the star formation efficiency varies in different parts of the Milky Way? Uh, yes, there are. Uh, actually, in the, at the very center, especially, uh, the star formation efficiency seems pretty low. You have formation of stars, but you have a lot of gas there, gathered, and that, that does nothing. And it's probably the dynamics of the clouds which is making some shear and which is uh, completely stopping the concentration of matter and formation of stars. That's an example, but you have a lot. What is a gray body model? of the spectral energy distribution. 
It means that you have an opacity law, which is not constant, but which is evolving with the, the, the wavelengths. And it means that uh, you're going to have a, a dust um, a model, which is not a single uh, grain of, of, of dust, but uh, with uh, the different sizes and different grain properties. OK, I think that's uh, all for the moment. <laughs> that's already a lot. I'm surprised. That's good. <laughs> Okay, so let's continue and, and go to the second topic, the location of the clouds in the Milky Way and uh, how we deal with that, because that's really difficult. That's a puzzle because we are in the Milky Way and in general when you are stargazing you see this very nice band of stars on top of your head, but it's difficult to go from that to what you have on the right, which is a very complex structure of the galaxy. And it was a lot of work that was necessary to get to that. Uh, just to present you the sketch of the galaxy that we have for the moment. We have the galactic bar here. We have main arms which are arriving here. We have other sub arms which are uh, getting out. And you have even uh, little arms, for example, going through uh, in, in the solar neighborhood, let's say. So to get access to that, you needed to have some um, wor work done by uh, modulus using C observations, using infrared. Now they're going to use Gaia and it, it's really a large bootstrap that you have to put uh, so that you can really get uh, this kind of uh, sketch, which is still a sketch and is, which is probably uh, now uh, kind of wrong for some places because it was uh, set after um, after Spitzer observation, so it was already 10 years ago. So um, here are the few uh, methods that are well used to define the distance uh, of a cloud in the Milky Way. Distance of the cloud is really major for, for us because we cannot uh, compare regions which are at 8 kiloparsecs and regions which are 100 parsecs from us uh, easily using the same observatory. So it's really important to get a good measurement of the distance. And I know that in the assembly, especially Delphine Russell knows much more than I do, but I'm going to do my best to present you how we do, we deal with this issue. So first of all, we're going to try to have a rotation model of the Milky Way. And using the kinematic distance of the cloud, what we call the VLSR sometimes, which is a line of sight projected velocity, uh, we compare it with models and we end up with some, um, some measurements of the distance of the cloud. Um, fortunately, this distance is not always unique and in general you have two distances, what we call the far distance and the near distance, simply because you are crossing several arms in one direction of the galaxy and you don't know if it's in, in the far arm or the near arm that you are looking at. And in some cases, you're, it's even worse. Maybe I'm going to show that again. So if you're looking in this direction, for example, you're going to have, uh, let's say no. Uh, but in this direction, you're going to have one arm, another arm. It's really difficult to know which arm is it, just looking at the velocity itself. And then uh, looking, if when you look at this direction there, uh, you're going to have uh, a lot of gas along the line of sight. So you have some, you're going to have some ambiguities. So that's not, uh, that's already something important and it has been used for decades. But uh, we've been also using some trigonometric parallaxes of mesosources. These trigonometric, oh, sorry, these parallaxes are our plane of the sky proportions of star, star forming sites. In general, these are mazes, mostly methanol mazes. But they give only a few constraints, which means that when you have a cloud uh, which is one degree um, uh, from a measure uh, where the distance is very well defined, it's difficult to be sure that this cloud is completely associated with uh, with this star forming site. So that's not uh, completely uh, comp that's not a complete picture that you can have with only measures. Then uh, we are using also uh, the fact that we expect velocity coherence between clouds saying that clouds are not point-like structures, but that they are more uh, uh, linear structures of, of, several stru of several clouds, let's say. And if you use uh, this uh, coherence, then you're going to have um, 
the possibility using both the position and the velocity of your cloud to, to define the, the velocity of a cloud with respect to a distance, to, sorry, the distance of a cloud from one cloud, which is already well known, for example. There is a Bessel project uh, led by uh, the Bonn uh, Max Planck, where uh, they've been uh, doing the combination of the three first points in order to have the best definition of the galaxy possible, using really all this information that we can have in all directions. And this is what we are using currently. Now Gaia has come, and it's just starting to, uh, let's say, uh, renovate the distance of uh, clouds. The, the difficulty with Gaia is that it's going to be sensitive mostly to nearby star forming sites because it's uh, observing in optical and infrared, and very soon you're going to be extincted uh, by, by the dust uh, or by the cloud, and you cannot anymore go further and, and check the distance of further clouds. But uh, they are doing a lot of uh, um, improvements, and it's going to be uh, the presentation uh, of uh, the local arm I'm going to give. So here is a presentation of uh, one of the models uh, made by uh, Rodriguez Fernandez using mostly CU uh, cloud at the time, but not only. And he's trying to define outer arm, connecting arms, uh, 3 kiloparsec arms, and so on. And this was called the molecular ring, which is not existing anymore, but you have the cardinal arm. So by doing that, you observe at one position in galactic longitude, and you define uh, if your velocity is pu putting you more on the outer arm or in the passive arm and so on and so on. So I'm telling you there are very often far and near distances. The velocities are not always very accurate. And we have difficult points like the tangent point, which is here. When you have uh, from the sun, it's this place here, where you have a collection of, of cloud from the same arm, but on the line of sight, very dif at different distances from us and the galactic center, which is a very, very complex region. So uh, let's start with uh, several pieces of uh, group, well, let's say several groups of clouds, so that you have a full picture of the galaxy. And let's start with the most nearby, which are the global clouds. These are relatively low mass regions and, and the size of a few tenths of a sec. Um, these are the global clouds. They were thought for long to be a, a, um, a belt, actually a ring. But for now, we could say it's a local system of clouds that form low mass objects, solar type from 0.1 to about uh, two solar mass, I should have said. Yeah. And um, in the solar neighborhood from 100 parsec to 500 parsec only. Um, it for, for more than one century from the Gould uh, proposition, the proposition of Gould in 1874, up to, in fact, very recently, it was thought that uh, this Gould was indeed an expanding ring of young stars and clouds. Just because here you have the galaxy plane, okay, uh, uh, latitude and longitude, and you can see that they are all piling up on some kind of elliptical uh, pattern that could be seen as a, as a ring. And if you look at the OB star clusters, which are uh, presented here with the size being the number of stars, and you could see also that they are kind of piling up around. So there were several scenarios saying that uh, this ring could be just due to some expansion of OB associations, OB association pu pushing the gas around. Some people were saying that this was a cloud shell expanding. Other people even imagined that uh, since it was more or less in the plane of uh, the galaxy, that we had a high velocity, high latitude cloud going through the galactic plane and, 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 and cutting the galactic plane into this hole, making a hole and then making this ring. But in fact, with Gaia, uh, things was, uh, the, the perspective was really changed. And it was found that, in fact, looking at a lot of position in these uh, gold belt clouds here, that in fact it was more some kind of a collection of clouds following a pattern which is, could be seen like a wave. Here you have the other side view, so looking at the, at the collection of clouds here, let's say. <coughs> and uh, these uh, filaments of cloud, let's say, uh, was very narrow. Uh, in general, the clouds in uh, Gulbat clouds are not uh, larger than 100 parsec wide. 
so it's uh, not wide than 100 parsec, but it's very, very long. And they even propose that it goes up to sinus X. So it means that this ring is now destroyed. And it tells you that uh, we have to re be really careful when we are within the galaxy. It's really difficult to be sure about what we are seeing. And uh, this collection of objects that was supposed to be around us and we at the center is really not the case. It's something which is oscillating, some kind of sub-arm in the Milky Way, which is called here the Radcliffe wave. Now, if we go to... Um, to cl cloud slightly further out to, so to show the diversity of the cloud in the Milky Way, I'm going to jump to these Hobbes clouds. Um, Hobbes clouds were in fact the 10 closest uh, massive cloud complexes forming IMA stars. They were uh, search for the IMA star formation content, actually, and they were imaged by Herschel by the Hobbes Consortium. They are the 10 uh, objects which are at around 1 and 3 kiloparsecs, so are jumping in distance. They are slightly larger, they are a factor of 10 more massive than global clouds. And here I present an extension map, which is another way to define clouds, uh, which was built from a uh, two mass uh, star ex uh, stellar ex extension. And this uh, extension map was coupled to CO cubes to be sure that we were seeing where well, we were seeing some high extension, like here, it was something which was coherent in velocity and that we could, could, could call a well, um, cloud complex. This allowed us, for example, to link sub-clouds that were uh, studied in the past and make them as full entities, which is rather important if you want to study structures at the same distance and have enough statistics. So these are uh, regions I'm going to discuss later on, Cygnus X. Uh, and this one, M16 and M17. And actually, we're going to focus on this one, on the, the extension map. Is, this was a typical case of region which was known to be nearby, but not connected. And when you have a look, both in CO and in extension, you really have a nice feature here, banana shape, let's say. And this, uh, once again, undulating structures is a piece of arm, a piece of galactic arm, and that's the reason why uh, you cannot imagine that clouds are just single roundish structures, but more filaments or pieces of clouds, pieces of, of arms, sorry. And the same case for here for the Nessie clouds, which was a very well-known structures here seen in the in extension. And on top of it, you have uh, the CO emission. So, uh, and once again, these molecular cloud complexes are all associated with OB star clusters. So there is a really a, a tight link between stars and, and, the, and the cloud. Um, I should say also that uh, this uh, uh, cloud, uh, agglomeration of cloud in, in uh, linear structures is kind of fine in uh, a numerical simulation. I'm going to show that uh, later on. So if we jump to other pieces of cloud, um, I'm going to go right away to the W43 region, which is kind of peculiar because we set it now uh, at the tip of the galactic bar. So it's a very specific position where you have a connection between the scutum arm and the galactic bar. So this region was first found to be extreme. Extreme when you look at all the traces you, we had in, in hand at the time. 8 micron is stressing uh, basically uh, the stars, uh, 13 CO is stressing dense cloud. And when you have a look at all that, you see that uh, when you focus in this uh, around, there is not much, and at this place, there is an accumulation of these traces. And it's the same when you look at the star function activity with glimpse, uh, with, uh, uh, when you look at the column density of the gas, and when you even look at the high density gas, as traced here by the 870 uh, micron surveys of Atlas Gal at Apex. So it tells you that here there is something strange happening, and which is not happening, let's say, a few uh, 10 degrees before and 10 degrees after in the in longitude in galactic. Longitude, sorry. So uh, what we did was uh, what I told you before, trying to make the connection between subclouds. These regions here were known before, but we tried to find some filaments, linking them, and see if they, are, uh, they have similar velocities. 
To do that, we, we use position and velocity diagram, which are shown here. So position here is galactic longitude. And velocity is the, the velocity that you have on the line of sight, which means that I took this uh, cut here, I sum up, summed up everything in velocity, and uh, I, I put them in, uh, in, in uh, position and galactic longitude and put in the y-axis the velocity. And you can see here that, for example, this Z-shaped filament is actually these structures in velocity. This uh, W43 South structures is that, and that you can make some link in velocity from one place to another. And that the cloud itself could be seen as all these structures in velocity, which is huge for a cloud. Uh, it's 30 km per, per, 30 km per second uh, wide in velocity range, which is really not common. And it's very large, it's more than 100 parsec wide. And it's so massive that it could be in, in a very equilibrium. So all that helps us define a cloud. And in fact, since it was pretty uh, extreme, uh, and uh, using only the kinematic distance at the time, we didn't know exactly at what position it was. But since it was extreme, we decided to put it here because it was more logical in, in the galactic uh, perspective. And in fact, later on, there were some parallax measurements of four mazes in this region, and we end up with exactly the same distance. We, we were assuming something like six kiloparsec, because I mean, it was difficult to be more precise, let's say, with just a sketch of the galaxy. And uh, it was found 5.5 .5 kiloparsec, so it was a really a very good agreement, which tells you that even with par, uh, sparse information, you can really get a good info definition of cloud structures, which is important for the studies that you're making with it. So now I'm ju jumping to the more complex region, which is the central molecular zone here. And I'm going to look first at the very, very central part. Once again, studied with Herschel by the IGA uh, surveys, you see here a three color images. Uh, once again, 250 micron is a cold gas, 70 micron is a hot gas. And you see that you have some kind of funny structures here, eight, like an eight, let's say. And these uh, figures, plus what was known of the different position in velocity with, for example, CO, told, uh, pushed uh, Sergio Neri to propose that in fact we were seeing an elliptical uh, ring like this one, we in some region uh, going back from us and some other region go going forward of us. And this twisted molecular ring uh, w would have a, a projected diameter of 200 parsec. But going one step further, this twisted uh, structure would be there. And if you go at larger scale or here, in this area here, if you look at really what we call the, the galactic, uh, the central molecular zone, CMZ, you will see sometimes, you see that you have not only this central, uh, this nuclear ring, but you have also some kiloparsec arms. So that's a sketch which is based on a model by Rodriguez Fernandez, which used all the constraints I've told you. So it tells you again that uh, the molecular clouds are not homogeneously distributed in the galaxy, but uh, have very uh, specific arms everywhere, in fact. And you have arms and pieces of arms everywhere. Rings sometimes, but these are uh, partial rings. So uh, that's the summary of uh, this presentation, which was a bit tedious because uh, these are plenty of, uh, of names that you don't know for most of you. But anyway, uh, I've presented you different groups of galactic clouds, and uh, we are doing this way, going from the closest to slightly further to the, to the most extreme ones at the tip of the bar, and uh, we are trying also to understand the central molecular zone. I didn't mention, but we are also looking at, at the outside part of the galaxy. So this group of clouds, there are pieces of galactic arms, and they are very important if you want to perform uh, studies which are homogeneous in distance, because you have, in general, a single uh, observational facility to, to observe, to, to, to use, and you don't want to um, mix structures that you're observing at 8 kiloparsec from 1 parsec and, and say, bad thing about them. These are different pieces of the Russian dots. So if you have questions, go on. 
Yes, so um, so the first one is uh, what made in the first place think that uh, the gold uh, belt was a belt? Oh, just the elliptical structure that it was observed and uh, some kind of velocity uh, coherent uh, pattern that was observed. But it was really uh, partial in a way. This, this belt was not complete, in fact. So it could be just a piece of an undulation. And this was a fact. And uh, uh, why, uh, so following on this one, now that this is the uh, arms, why is it oscillating uh, uh, around the midplane? Uh, this, I, I must say, I don't know at all, but I have the impression that uh, in a way we have um, uh, waves going through the arms and going to, through the plane and it's impacting clouds, not uh, like a front, uh, like a shock front. And you have oscillations everywhere. When you look at spurs, for example, of, of galaxies, and I think Annie is going to show things about that, th these are not a linear structure either. So it, I don't, I cannot say much more, and I think people are going to work on that because it's pretty new. But uh, this is logical that uh, we are in a, in, let's say, a turbulent medium which is not making straight uh, things. Uh... With what uh, reliability do we know the number of spiral arms uh, uh, in the Milky Way? Well, we know the brightest ones, and actually we kind of merge the information of stars and the information of, of clouds, which are not exactly at the same place. We know that from, from extragalactic studies, that there is a shift between the star component and the, and the cloud component. So I could not say exactly, but for sure, uh, at the beginning, we thought there was only two arms, and then we had a few more and a few more sub arms. So we are going to complexify our picture. And even if we have two major arms in our galaxy, there are many more. Mm. Um, what is the nature of the three kiloparsec arms? Uh, is it the inner tightly wounded spiral arms? Or is it uh, the extended structure connected to with the galactic ring? Uh, so for this, I'm gonna go down here, maybe. Um, in, in fact, uh, what what is observed in in numerical simulation is that it's not a homogeneous bar that you have here. So at some point they were saying that there is a three kiloparsec arm, but it could be just uh, these uh, arms that we are observing. Honestly, I don't know exactly, but uh, that's a very confused region and it's changing uh, from time to time, actually. And then there are several questions about the CNZ. So uh, the first one is, do you have an opinion on the expanding ring theory instead of the X1, X2 orbit? Ooh, I don't know much about that. The only thing I can tell you is that um, uh, for sure, um, you, have you have clouds, gas, coming from here, and even stars, in fact, uh, some red uh, stars, uh, giant stars are coming here. So yes, so we have some fueling of gas and, and, and motion and turbulence at this place. And it's perturbing a lot, the structure that you have here. So indeed, uh, th these uh, arms are, once again, not complete. And in some places, it seems to be forming stars. In some places, it doesn't form stars. So they kind of imagine that you have a fueling of gas, maybe piling up like W43 for the moment, and at some, some point it swallowed the gas and the stars at the same time. So it's gathering a lot of uh, uh, velocity uh, incoherent structures and uh, material to form uh, stars. So it's perturbing all the time the, the structure that you have here, which is set by the galaxy itself. So uh, I think this is also related to, to the CNZ, uh, but I'm not completely sure. What, what about the, the more recent interpretation of the 100 parsec ring that describe it as one or more open-ended streams? I'm not sure I understood properly. Yeah, I'm, I'm not completely sure. OK, you'll, you'll answer this one maybe live uh, in the um, do you think that uh, can, uh, do you think that the CNZ in ca CNZ uh, can turn into a nuclear starburst? Uh, there are starbursting regions, uh, arches. If, for example, it's a cluster which is a starburst cluster, uh, so it's 
it's still a galactic star bus cluster. It's not as extreme as what you have in extragalactic uh, surveys, but still it's very, very active uh, regions. And you have places like one uh, cloud, and well, yeah, just next to it, which is called the brick, where you have a lot, a lot of gas, column density, which is impressive, even density, which is kind of high, but the velocity uh, dispersion that you have in this region is probably shearing the gas and, and really not allowing it to get peacefully to concentrate and form stars. So there is star formation, which is almost nothing here. Uh, going back to the gold belt, um, Caroline Bo is saying that uh, high latitude clouds, uh, molecular clouds, uh, or diffuse clouds, were, were thought to be uh, part of this bubble. So now this is not a bubble anymore. Are the high latitude clouds still part of it? I think they are dropped now. I, I didn't have a look carefully, but I think they are not in, in, this, um, in this picture anymore. And uh, well, that's probably partial. And I would say that uh, the group of Alvesh went to the strongest ones. And uh, you have Sivirus, which is here. Honestly, I, I cannot say much more, but it seems that uh, they, they, they were not observing all the clouds uh, similarly. And uh, the last question for now, uh, certain, the carbon 13, the isotopes, uh, the, its its abundance, elemental abundance, uh, depends on the uh, mass function uh, and the mass distribution of the nearby star. So, why uh, can we still use certain CU as a tool to study the structures and kinematics? So I think the question is more about uh, how do we come from CO to and certain CO even worse to the mass of H2, something like that. that that's a, a difficulty which is uh, inherent of our studies and even worse when you go for lower metallicity and higher metallicity medium. And uh, uh, well, myself, I'm not using the 13 CO much for, for measuring mass, but there are large uncertainties for sure. But 13 CO is interesting in very dense region like W43 because you are dropping the low density clouds and you ma ma manage to refocus on the dense part where you can have a look at the velocity trend that you were asking for to, to make a link. Because if you use 12 CO, everything is going to be linked in this area. Okay, uh, for the audience, uh, please send your questions to the Slack, not, not to the question and answer of the, of the Zoom. Uh, continue, please. Okay, so now um, let's go on with the scenarios of star formation. Oh, sorry, of cloud formation. <laughs> I'm a star formation people. <laughs> so um, we for long thought that uh, clouds could form peacefully in our galaxy. That was a biased view coming from the fact that we were observing global clouds for decades. And global clouds are in our neighborhood slowly uh, concentrating, slowly forming stars and so on. And because we kind of separate our view from the galactic view. Uh, in the, honestly, in the 1980s, uh, 1970s, 1980s, people were really more uh, working both on galaxy uh, structures and clouds, and they were thinking that clouds could be uh, dynamical. But we've spent something like two decades now thinking differently. And it was helping both uh, people making theories because it's always easier to have something which is kind of peacefully forming. And uh, also it was helping, um, well, uh, yeah, sorry. So in practice, what we thought is that uh, the cloud were slowly forming out of H1. I was still telling you that there is, there is indeed a, a phase uh, um, change from H1 to H2 to form the molecular cloud. But this could have been done really slowly. So in the end, you end up with a cloud which is located as a roundish structure here and surrounded by H1. That's uh, a school case. But that's really the way people were thinking that you 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 would really uh, slowly form this kind of cloud, and they were not connected to other clouds nearby. Then cloud complexes would form as the agglomeration as ag agglomerated clouds in the spy arms, 
this is a simulation by Claire Dobbs, and you see that clouds and spurs are really near structures which are along the galactic arms. Then, uh, on the second step, uh, you would form a cloud, um, you would form filaments in these clouds. That's a simulation by Paolo Padoan, but all the people were doing this kind of simulation at the time. So you see a lot of shocks forming these filaments there. Uh, there is no uh, places which is much more, much denser than others. And you have a network of very heavy filamentary structures in this area. Uh, this, um, uh, well, okay. So then stars would form in the densest filament that you would find when they start to be gravitationally uh, supercritical, as said. And when the stars would, would uh, form, they would then act as feedback back, uh, agent through their outflows or through H2 when they get uh, massive, and that's the case here. So in fact, in these uh, clouds, they were supposed to be uh, turbulent driven clouds in a way. Uh, the, the turbulence is driven by the outflow, the H2 region, the turbulence, but there is no real impact from outside. And, and this uh, square of uh, molecular cloud is going to be stable, more or less, all the time. And these objects are supposed to be also uh, lasting for long there. Now, uh, we I'm uh, gonna, I, I forgot, since we are uh, to have a bit of fun, I, I'm gonna show you a presentation uh, that was made uh, with uh, subtitle in French, I'm sorry for that, which is showing you a bit some diffuse cloud, that's uh, Polaris cloud, uh, which has, is actually the, the subject of the topic of study of the project 11, led by Jean-François Bitaille. You have here a cloud. It really looks like the simulation I just showed you, with some places which are slightly denser. So it's a network with lots of turbulence. And in some places, you have some pores which are forming in the densest regions. Oh, oh. Sorry. And um, it's a bit long. And when you get into dense filaments, that's another cloud, which looks really like, except that it's forming slightly more stars. And you see that we kind of imagine that you have a turbulence, which is forming step by step dense part. And then we, we have the observation, the real observations, with cores that you see here and there. And in some places, some very massive objects that are popping up as H2 region in the end. We're gonna have one here. So this cycle of matter is really quite evolving. And either you have some H2 region which are at the within the cloud or in the outskirts. I'm gonna show another one which is the Rosette uh, H2 region here. Next to this H2 bubble have a cloud which is going to be seen in absorption and emission with Herschel and, uh, and Spitzer. So you see interaction through the pillars that are seen in, in extinction here and in, in emission with Herschel. And, but most of the cloud here is probably not much impacted by this H2 region, just through turbulent shocks going through and adding turbulence. So that's the quite view of star formation and cloud formation because they are both they are all linked and uh, and I'm gonna sorry it was pretty loud um, so I'm gonna continue saying that uh, we now more and more people think uh, that we are more in a dynamical picture uh, to form clouds and there is a converging flow theories telling you that you are having a warm neutral medium flows from the left and right here scene colliding and at the very center you are forming some molecular clouds which are getting denser by once again by uh, cell screening themselves and this is an example of a simulation which was done a very long time ago so it's a single fluid it's, uh, there is no transition from H1 to H2 but you see that it's very different in shape from what I showed you before you still have filaments but it's more organized you have a one direction which is in fact a collision direction and you have, you have a lot of diffuse gas around, 
which is not probably forming stars. So it's a, it's a different way of seeing a cloud uh, as less homogeneous in a way in a, in a, few, in a cube. Let's say. So uh, the compression is driven most probably by the large scale instabilities in, in the galaxy uh, through the arms and the bar. Uh, the clouds form by this phase transition and they continuously accrete mass because this flow of gas is not going to be for just a short while. It's going to be fueling, maybe not continuously, but it's going to be continuous, uh, uh, continue uh, accreting mass. Then part of the clouds are going to undergo collapse, the densest part probably, and the other parts are going to disperse so this kind of system is completely out of equilibrium. You don't have uh, the same area at the beginning of the, the, of the simulation and at the end. This is going to contract a lot. And you are going to have places which are very dense and places which are pretty low. And in this case, in fact, sorry, the turbulence is mostly driven by compression and by the co contraction of the gas, gravitational contraction. Uh, these theories, uh, there, are, there were really a lot of people do, doing some numerical simulations and there were also observers thinking of sketch, not at the scale of H1, but more in molecular clouds. And in fact, this view is completely complementary because probably when you've done some H1, uh, H2 formation from H1, you're going to have dense filaments or dense clouds that are going to collide and merge. And you're going to have uh, then uh, structures that we call cloud ridges or hubs that are going to be connected to very dense filaments and con continue accreting from the outskirts. So this, uh, these ridges are uh, probably uh, the very important places where these obi clusters are forming. So you have obi cluster here and here you have a mini starbus cluster which is going to form something very similar to the obi cluster next to it. Uh, here are uh, simulations uh, of these ridges, so see, that's the inner part of uh, simulation, the big simulation that I showed you before. You have some accretion of gas uh, coming from uh, everywhere, and in fact in some places you even have some uh, gas which is going out. I'm telling you, not all the gas is going to go in one single point, otherwise the star, for star formation efficiency is going to be too high. But the motions are making things dispersed in some places and uh, agglomerated in some other places. So most of the numeration now are going this direction to form stars. And in fact, here is a very nice paper by uh, Wu and collaborators, which is doing some simulations with colliding flows and without colliding flows. And what is uh, most striking is that here you have something which is rather homogeneous everywhere. And keeping the same place as the time passes. And there you have uh, places which are really diffuse and, and places which are really more concentrated. So you could see that that's the center of a cloud. Sorry. Uh, now that uh, numerical simulations are feasible on kiloparsec size, this is basically the eighth of the arm, so it's a kiloparsec box that people are using. They, they really uh, show that the hierarchy of cloud structures and inflows is very important and that we have to think about it when you, th you think about even the star formation, which is really the latest phase of the, the cloud concentration. Well, as for observation, uh, this is something we, we start to think. When I was doing my PhD, uh, already a long time ago, I must admit, uh, we were really observing only cores, so this really little concentration of gas, which are here driving outflows, for example, so this one is a photostar, and we were, were not taking care about what was outside, and when we were defining the cores, the mass, it was just there, and that's it. And in fact, now that we know that every scales are connected by inflow, not just by structure, but by, by inflow as well, we have to take care about the surrounding of this object, the ridges, for example, the surrounding of the ridges, these gas inflows that you have here, and even the OB clusters that are within these molecular cloud complexes that are going to impact adding turbulence, ionization, ionization fraction, and so on. So that's something important. And when you have a look at these uh, ridges, no, sorry. And then I'm going to show you two, two things about um, two observations uh, going in the direction to say that we are in this dynamical picture for sure in the region which are forming massive stars. I'm going to go back to the W43 uh, region, 
I showed you something which was just there and I'm going to expand my view and look at the H1 around. So H1 gas is less, less massive and you have here it in color. So you see it's actually uh, showing that it's a, a shell around the molecular cloud. And when uh, you compare this uh, to uh, the, the picture of Mark Krummeltz, at zero order it seems to be the same. You have the H2 inside and the H1 outside. But in fact, if you look at the column density of the different components, there is a lot of transition between H1 and H2. It's not something that forms slightly uh, centrally concentrated. It's more one piece of cloud here, one piece of there, and then the agglomeration of all that. And this multiple transition are making the column density of H1 versus H2 very different. So this, mo this um, model by Krimots is does not apply to this region which are extreme and in general to the region which are forming massive stars. Then if you look at H1 even outside this envelope uh, of gas, we have this W43 structure here. And I'm giving you here a picture of the velocity versus longitude. So once again, I've piled all the, the velocities of the components on the latitude, and that's plotted as a function of longitude. So W43 is there in squarent. You see it has a different velocity pattern there, but it's squarent. And you see that you have in red velocity gradients, which are joining this pattern, this place here in, uh, in H1. And uh, in fact, if you look at the models that you would have as a long bar and the scutum center as arm, it's not perfect. Hmm? We are offset here. You see, in velocity, we should really be at not exactly at the same place, but it's the same kind of structure. You really have one long bar velocity gradient and one associated with the scutum center as arm joining here at the place where W43 is. So we are showing here that, in fact, we see H1 uh, forming uh, massive cloud complexes in our Milky Way. And uh, it's currently saying that uh, the story of, uh, of, the, uh, of what's happening in the galaxy is impacting our uh, mass and, and velocity structure in these kind of uh, clouds. Uh, there, are, there were some uh, nice uh, numerical submissions by, made by Florent Renaud, who is going to talk uh, later this week, we, which show that uh, you, you're going to have the possibility indeed on these arms to have several clouds piling up here and collisioning here at the edge of what was called the galactic bore, and that was resembling a lot the W43. And uh, wh when I was telling you that it, this kind of parts stay for a while and then are swallowed, this is what's happening in this kind of scenario, that they remain there and then at some point they, they are grabbed, sorry, they are grabbed by, by the galactic center. I should also say that at the other side of the bar, there is nothing for the moment. So it's not something which is continuous. You have a, a piling up of matter, forming stars, which is uh, very efficiently uh, done, and then uh, everything is swallowed by the, the, the galactic bar or the galactic uh, central molecular zone, which is complex. So what else? Uh, then uh, if we look at uh, the, definition, the rich definition, so that's, that, that's very much smaller scales now, uh, we define this as regions which were pretty dense, because they have the density of uh, Priscilla cores, in our jargon, and they are very large, one per sec cube in volume. These are the structures there. And uh, they are connected to filaments, which are in fact it themselves very dense as well, because they, they are in fact denser than the torus clouds that uh, for some of you, you know, and uh, which are forming uh, low mass stars in Taurus. The main torus filament uh, is uh, lower in intensity than these ones. So we have uh, here a real key of structure which is much denser and much more dynamic than, than Taurus. Uh, some people uh, don't, uh, don't uh, talk about uh, ridges but hubs because it's more uh, roundish, but the situation is the same. It's just a question of geometry. So uh, I'm, I was talking about global infall, and in fact, in these regions, you have global infall. That's the region observed in 13 CO with some drift of material observed. And that's the, the region observed actually in H13 CO plus and HCO plus. And you see that comparing this optically thin and optically thick line, that 
these all structures is globally collapsing on itself with velocities which are about one kilo per, sec per, per second. One, sorry, one kilometer per second. So that's quite, kind of a lot. And this has been observed in many regions now. So the central part of molecular complexes forming massive stars that were formed probably uh, dynamically are dynamical themselves. And in fact, uh, another proof of the, of the shocks that we have in this region is given by uh, the SIO molecules. SIO is classically associated with protocellular outflows, shocks. Uh, Sylvie Cabri is going to probably present that uh, later this week. And in fact, in this region here, that's another ridge. I use the same elliptical area to define the ridge of few pieces, you see, few parsec wide, okay? And in this area, uh, more than half of the, the, the SIO emission is not associated to outflows, but it is associated to a component which is wide, but not as wide as outflows, and which is a propo proposing that you have some shocks of material arriving, in fact, from this area and from this area, when you look in CO, and converging to this place where it's merging and forming an increasing, in incredibly uh, uh, high density regions. Um, uh, we were using shock models by, by the group of uh, Antoine Gusdorf to, to conclude to, to this uh, kind of velocity. Uh, so for the conclusion of part three, I would say that um, we have several uh, models of uh, formation of clouds, quasi-static versus dynamical. And here we are, uh, that, that's a very good example for a paradigm change. In the 70s, we were, uh, the community was more thinking about dynamical formation of clouds. Then it came up to quasi-static because it's easier to think about I'm forming a star, a uh, cloud, I'm forming then a filament, then I'm forming a star, uh, rather than having everything at the same time. So it was for simplicity for the models, but also for our mind in a way. And uh, that's, uh, that's a good way of seeing that. Uh, there are many arguments to say that uh, the dynamical view is kind of winning for most of the regions in the Milky Way, but the local clouds and more isolated clouds, like the inter-arm clouds, for example, they could be correctly uh, described by quasi-static model. So I'm not saying that everything is dynamical. It really depends where you look in the, in the galaxy. If you have questions. Yes, so um, in fact, what's the role of the galactic shear in, uh, in uh, the evolution of molecular clouds? So uh, a cloud is going to have a certain lifetime and to remain uh, by itself, it needs to be either virilized, meaning that uh, the gravity is going to keep it by itself, or it needs to be not impacted by the outside. And when you have some velocity gradient around the arms, and especially at the position, for example, of the, of the variation of velocity between the arms and the bar velocity, which are really different, you're going to have some shears, meaning that the clouds are going to be stretched. And uh, the cloud itself is not going to be able to stay for long as a single entity. And by doing that, Self gravity cannot handle uh, the, the concentration of matter and can uh, modify the, its capacity to form stars and, and the star formation efficiency in the end. And so there was a, a related question uh, before. Uh, are there any uh, simulations, uh, MHD simulations, that takes into account uh, galactic shear? Yeah, uh, there are. There are also some numeric, uh, theoretical models trying to take this into account. The, but the shear, I think, is within uh, the, the numerical simulations. Uh, the shear is nothing else than just uh, variations of velocity of different components of a cloud, because a cloud is not a single entity. Once again, it has some substructures. If, if, uh, if they, they manage to stay together because the velocity difference is not so, so different, it's fine. If they are going to pass through each other, it's going to destroy the, the, the cloud. And, Maybe this cloud is going to form low mass stars, but it won't be able to concentrate itself a lot to form ridges and high mass stars. So that's observed, that's observed in uh, numerical simulations, and uh, that's within. So there is another question that is, uh, do we ever see star formation in the filaments themselves? Um, so filaments, uh, these are just filamentous structures. So it tells you nothing about its capacity to form stars or not. 
uh, then we you use a, a, a complete uh, uh, zoo of uh, name to, to call them. Uh, for example, the very low density structures which are in molecular clouds, we call them striations. These striations are too low density to form stars. Then uh, we have uh, uh, filaments which are more massive, which we say uh, are um, gravitationally unstable, and, and they, they, they really um, can, in that case, subfragment and have uh, some kind of uh, uh, succession of cores and form stars. Then you can have some more massive uh, filaments, which are these ridges. So um, I think I, I, can, I cannot say more. Some are forming, some are not forming stars. And so uh, the the low the low velocity shocks that form SIO uh, are they are they caused by the cloud interactions? It's probable that it's actually the cloud that could go through them. Uh, the, you have several velocity components that are going to join themselves because of uh, the gravity of the central region here, and uh, there's going to be some little turbulence uh, convexity convex uh, vertex. That are going to, in practice, make some uh, some local shears once again, and this is going to make some little shocks. And these shocks cumulating by, by this release of these different velocities going to, uh, to to reach each others are going to create this SIO emission. And in fact, in this area here, you have a large uh, complex of um, of cores forming stars actively, and here you have quite nothing. But if you look in um, in uh, N2H plus, if you look in SIO, it's very active. So here we are forming probably the next generation, uh, well, the the, the nearby uh, place uh, where it's going to form stars in the future, in the close future. While here it's forming actively stars now. It's the way the the, the clouds are forming sequentially. Um... About W43, um, is the GMC complex formed by continuous uh, atomic H1 uh, flows from scutum and uh, the long bar? So I've been able to look at the, at the flow on a scale of um, 800 parsec. So along 800 parsec, you have this velocity, which is the velocity of the scutum arm, okay? And it's, uh, it's blobby, it's not continuous. So you could expect that uh, here you are fueling part by part, but maybe at some point this is going to be completely gathered by, by, by the galactic center and it's going to be ended. But that's for sure that it's continuing accreting gas from H1. And uh, do the large scale converging flows uh, trigger mini starburst in uh, W43? Actually, uh, W43 is the first region where we call it mini starburst. For me, it was a cloud which has the ability to form a starburst cluster uh, well, at the scale of the galaxy. And indeed, in this region, we have a lot of uh, stars which are forming. And uh, so in, you need large dynamics to gather large mass at uh, parsec scale, or even 100 parsec scale, 10 parsec scale, 1 parsec scale. And at 1 parsec scale, you are more or less at the scale of, of clusters which are forming at one go in free flow time. It's where the, the stars are, are forming actively. Okay, that's all. Thanks a lot. So let's go back on the flow. Uh, so now about their properties and, and the statistical tools and scaling relation that uh, we've uh, set up for the clouds. Um, it's completely related to project 11, which is named Multiscale and Statistical Analysis of Observed and Simulated astro Astronomical uh, Data. Uh, Jean-François Orbital is leading this, uh, this uh, tool with Benoit Commerson. Benoit Commerson provided some numerical simulation. Jean-François Orbital got some actual data. And he's uh, going to drive people on the different tools that were used to understand the structure of a cloud, so mostly about cloud, uh, the density structure, but it could be applied to velocity structure at some point. And um, uh, I'm going to really shortly present uh, a few tools about that. So um, it all started with Larson a long time ago already, and uh, during several decades, uh, even 50, almost 50 years actually, 
uh, it was thought that there were several relations between the velocity dispersion of clouds. So the, it's the line width of lines uh, telling you that uh, a cloud is turbulent or not. And the size of the cloud that you are looking at, similarly with the mass and the, uh, I don't remember the, this is exactly the, the two, three different relations, but this one, let's say, is uh, the most uh, complete and probably the, the if, if there is one which is physical, that's the one. And it was observed to be really uh, incredibly uh, linear up to, uh, and, and it was uh, pushing us to, uh, to think that there, there is a universal turbulent cascade, which is creating the structure of a cloud and uh, similarly uh, creating the velocity structure of a cloud. Then it was, re uh, it was re observed, let's say, by uh, Ayer et al. In, in 2009. And what they found is that, in fact, that's a Larsen relation and that's the initial points. But there were plenty of points that didn't fit at all. And he was thinking, OK, maybe we should add a dependence on the surface density of the medium because this Larson law was mostly uh, set up on nearby clouds once again, so they are very similar, they are pretty low density, low column density and low surface uh, mass density. And so he proposed another relation, uh, introducing the, this sigma, which is the, the mass surface density. And other people like Balesteros went even further, Balesteros Paradis, I forgot to add Paradis. Uh, uh, and said that, in fact, there is no correlation at all. Uh, it's uh, really difficult uh, when you use several samples from, th from several uh, clouds uh, with, taken with different uh, telescopes. Uh, it's spreading all the way and that there is no real uh, co correlation between uh, either the size and, and, and um, I think it was, it was the, the size and the mass size and, and the, the velocity uh, dispersion and so on and that uh, it's just uh, probably a result of observational biases with one single type of cloud with a certain threshold, for example, to define cloud. We sometimes define a threshold in column density to see the, the clouds which are observed uh, above this threshold. And when we observe uh, the global cloud, we are looking at, the, at our neighborhood, which is not typical for, galaxy, for galaxies in general. So all that end up with a, a belief that, in fact, this last one lows that were thought to be loose, could be seen as Larsen relation. They are probably related somehow to turbulence, but it's not showing you that you have a universal turbulence cascade at all. Then uh, there was also a question about the, about the, the decryption of the, the, the energies. At zero order, uh, the virial uh, um, theory is trying to make the decryption between gravity and thermal pressure. And we see that most of the cloud, in fact, lie well above this relation. So uh, either there are other uh, parameters that enter into the play. For example, outer pressure is uh, never taken into account. Or for the, the sustainance of, of the cloud, the, the B field, for example. Uh, or, in fact, this uh, source, this region are more free-falling. If you add more observation, actually, you're going to find that some clouds are sub some others are super -virulized. So in practice, there is a wide variety of structures and, and it's like what is observed in simulation. Some live longer, longer than others. It depends on their position mostly in the galaxy. Now, um, there have been several tools used to study the structures of a cloud. The one which was used for long is the power spectrum. It's, it's related, in fact, to the energy cascade you have here the power at a certain scale, with small scales being there and large scale being there. You have, uh, if you have something which is with a similar index, then you're going to have uh, no process, physical process getting into play. And this turbulent cascade is really fractal or, or is a hierarchy scale free. Uh, I forgot to say that here in general, that's the, the scale of the energy injection. And that's believed to be the viscous dissipation scale if there is one. It's difficult in general with our observation to really observe anything that a piece of this uh, initial range. We don't have in general access to, to this scale and this one. So uh, poor, uh, poor spectrum are, are very interesting and they all showed this kind of similar, uh, similar cinema pattern with a single power law, let's say, for a lot of scale. 
Then there were a uh, lot of studies done with PDF. PDFs, these are called, um, these are probability distribution function, meaning that here, that's a probability of um, uh, variable to be, be between this value and the, and the one next to it, between, let's say, the AV here, for example, or the column density, and the column density plus delta column density. So from, uh, oh, sorry, from, I need to put some power. From the observations, uh, as well as numerical simulations. Wow, do you see something strange here? No, it's fine? No, it's fine. Okay, it's just on my screen. Okay, so um, observation and simulations have found that uh, uh, PDF were showing mostly um, log normal shape that sometimes is related to the turbulence uh, and Mach number, uh, but it's debated. And the polar tail, which is really going up uh, above this uh, sh shape of, polar, of, um, of log normal, and that could be associated to either gravity dominated or pressure dominated regions. Pressure dominated regions correspond to region, uh, for example, compressed by H2 regions, and gravity dominated means this series of cores that you have everywhere in filaments and plus filaments. Uh, when you go to observations, it's uh, even more interesting when you look at the PDF of very dense regions forming IMA stars. Here you have NGC uh, 6334, sorry, there is a mistake here, W43. <coughs> and you see, in fact, not only one tail, but a second tail. And this second tail, it's at a very high column density, which is meaning that these are structures which are the densest. And in general, that's associated to a um, um, slope of the density structure of uh, the central part of the cloud, which is very steep. That's confirmed here by the column density uh, radian pro transverse profile of uh, one of the um, uh, ridge, which is the R21. While most of the filament, in fact, have a plumer like profile, which is given by this uh, P come equal to uh, formula here. In fact, the ridges are in general steeper. So it's, it's this steeper profile here in physical form is related to this flattening of the PDF slope. And these slopes are uh, su suggest that the concentrated ridges have a typical density profile and uh, that they are probably places where something else is happening. Not only gravity, because it was thought that this is uh, shaped by gravity, but it could be that either rotation of the structure or magnetic field is entered into play and kind of uh, slowing the contraction, the global contraction, which is normally would make uh, ominous to structure everywhere and would kind of steepen the out, uh, outer part while keeping the, the central part rather stable, more stable, let's say. Um, there is another tool which is going to be presented a lot by uh, Jean-François Orbital, which is really uh, efficient, which is the multi-scale non-Gaussian segmentation tool, MNGSEG. And it's based on complex wavelets, and it combines both the PDF I just showed and the power spectrum analysis I showed before as well. By doing, uh, by applying that, you manage to separate one component, which is called the Gaussian component, because it has a Gaussian PDF, like the log normal uh, shape I gave you before. And another one, which is uh, aside this Gaussian component, which is called coherent. And this Gaussian component in, in general is, uh, is associated with structure which are not coherent, which means that you're gonna have a structure, a very large structure there and a small one there and so on. It's not, it's not uh, uh, concentrated, while the current components are really seen at the same scale. You're going to have a large structure and then a smaller one, like the Russian doll I was mentioning before. So this is associated with turbulence, with what we could call cirrus, cirrus, which are these fluffy structures of the cloud, while this is a very dense part where you have the filaments, and here that's the, the, double, the DR21 ridge, and the, the structures, uh, the stars forming inside. And here is a presentation of this uh, power spectrum. You have the power as a function of the scale, actually scale going in this direction. Small scales are here, large scales are there. And you see that you manage to separate the Gaussian structures from very small scales to large scale, from
from the current structure from small scale to large scale. So this uh, uh, technique uh, is uh, slightly more efficient than the delta variance, but the, the philosophy is uh, the same. It's start to be rather similar to the RWST technique developed by Alice and other uh, multifractal technique developed by Yaya. So there are several uh, now tools more complex than the usual PDF uh, or power spectrum tools that we were using for long that try now to go one step further and separ separate the, the, the molecular cloud into pieces to show that in fact it has several nature and in fact a multifractal nature. Because here uh, the, the Gaussian component is monofractal, it's just uh, one fractality, while here Depending on where you look, you're going to have a fractal uh, component, a fractal uh, index, which is going to be different. And that's probably look, uh, related to the star formation efficiency or star formation uh, activity in the center. Because we know that the star formation activity is going to be different in regions here than in more local uh, filaments there. So, in fact, uh, uh, here I'm showing just one slide about uh, object-oriented uh, analysis tools, while well, that's my expertise, I should say. Uh, there are really a lot of techniques that were developed for decades to identify local peaks that we call core elements. Uh, uh, to mention one which I'm using a lot, it's GetSF for cores, and uh, for example, uh, uh, get filament for filaments. So you have the ability to, to see that in this kind of area, you have uh, definition of filaments and cores, and here I'm, I'm mentioning the, the rich value of a lot of cores forming, piling up. And the goal, the final goal uh, between this kind of study, statistical versus object-oriented, is not to say one is better than the other, we need each other's, and it's, uh, the final goal would be to make the link between the hierarchical structure and the hierarchical info uh, structures of clouds with core properties. And that the goal actually of one project uh, we are starting now with people from ENS and people from um, CS actually. So uh, that's a summary of part four. <clears throat> the properties of, uh, of uh, clouds are difficult to, to define. They are related to, to <clears throat> sorry, to turbulence, but not only. We are, there are several uh, newer techniques which are developed and they are going to help us understand better the structure. And um, we have to understand how the multifractal structures can impact the, the star formation relation that we are using, star formation rate, star formation efficiency, and core mass function. I'm going to just point out just after this. And uh, I should say that uh, I don't say much more than that, but uh, for tools, please contact uh, Jean-François Orbital and Benoît Commerso, because they know much more than I do. Uh, and there's going to be this uh, discussion about the B field in uh, the presentation of François Boulanger. I'm not going to present that. And uh, for the last in relation, I think Annie Hughes is going to present a lot. Do you have a question? Yes. Uh, how do you estimate the age of the cloud? Is it possible? <laughs> no, that's not possible. In, in fact, a parcel of cloud is not going to stay in the cloud forever. Its uh, gravity potential is can be stay the same, but parcel of cloud is going to move uh, in and out easily. So def defining a timing for the, the beginning of a cloud could be the transition between H1 and H2. But I told you, it's forming from the agglomeration of structures, so it doesn't help much because you're going to have a timing for the first molecular cloud structure, but not from the full structure that you are looking at. So that's difficult. And uh, we are using also the age of stars uh, to say this uh, cloud has been forming cloud for this many uh, giga year, for example. So there is nothing very easy. And when we are using, when we are measuring star formation rates, for example, we need a timeline, uh, a time. So either we use the free fall time of the cloud which we are, we are observing right now, or we are focusing on, on, on the very specific uh, stars forming of a certain age, like Titori stars or, or protostars and so on. That's it. It's really difficult. Why, why, uh, are, uh, why do we see so many filaments uh, in the SM? Is it, is it related to their uh, formation mechanisms? Uh, in fact, um, you have little shocks in all simulations, even if you don't make a colliding flows, okay? 
You have little shocks everywhere. And when you have a shock, you're going to form a sheet. And this sheet is going to be very rapidly fragmenting into filaments. So that's, uh, that's a normal uh, outcome of any process in the ISM when you have some motion, turbulent motions, which are making little shocks here and there. It's even worse when you have some colli collision, which are making uh, motion even stronger. And what is the role of feedback? So yeah, I mentioned not mentioning feedback much because feedback is really important to uh, stop the formation of stars in a region like, for example, the ridges, otherwise the, the efficiency is going to be too high. And um, uh, for the moment, it seems that none of the outflow H2 regions, supernova remnant, are going to be the most important ones. They all are necessary. In the very densest part, it's the H2 regions that, that are really necessary. In the more diffuse parts, that's the supernovae that are going to be necessary. So we need all these components and they are uh, used, uh, they are treated in numerical simulations and well, they all are there to dissipate the cloud so that uh, it doesn't stay for forever. But the other thing that we are not thinking uh, generally is that the kinematics of the, the galaxy itself is going to disrupt clouds as well. So that's another feedback. And uh, there are two related questions about uh, comparisons with structures in uh, cosmology um, or, or at lar much larger scales is whether, uh, the, whether the people in the star formation uh, uh, community are comparing with cosmologists and uh, do you, for instance, uh, do, do, we, do we use uh, topological tools such as Chimis, Betin and uh, Persistent homology. Oh la la. <laughs> no, I cannot answer that. But I can I can tell you that the people that are making uh, big numerical simulations for star formation are tightly linked to people making some cosmological simulations. So the tools are uh, more or less the same. Uh, the grids, for example, are the same. But then uh, they are the things are. Fine. You don't put dark energy in, in simulation of molecular clouds, uh, except if you really need to do that on galaxies. So in ours, we don't. So um, uh, well, I cannot say much more than that, I'm afraid. Okay. Uh, but you ask ask Benoît Commerson, by the way. Ask Benoît Commerson, he should say. He should be able to say. You have 10 more minutes. Okay. So it's going to be fastly going to the last point. Um, so... Uh, now, about star formation, I I'm telling you that stars are forming in clouds, that's not a new, but um, uh, cl I, I told you that molecular clouds are in fact fragmenting and concentrating into filaments, that cores are forming into these filaments. So that's the picture for low mass star formation I'm going to present now. And along these filaments, you're going to have prislar cores, which are going con to concentrate up to be uh, gravitationally bound and up to be starting to collapse, so at the, on the verge of collapse. These cores, when they start to be collapsing, they, they end up into the protostellar phase, where you have a protostellar envelope collapsing onto itself and feeding the, the stellar embryo at the center. And you have an outflow, which is there to get rid of the, the angular momentum of the gas, which is gathered at the very center. And at some point, uh, the envelope dissipates and you enter the phase of, which is called the pre-main sequence phase, where you have titori stars, which are surrounded by a single uh, disk and where the, the protoplanets are forming. Uh, and, uh, but when you are interested in uh, the mass of, of the core and the mass of the star in the end of the main sequence, this phase is not the most important because the mass of the star is going to be more or less constant. So it's more the protostellar phase and the pristular phase, which are the most important. At least in the low mass star regime, we saw that uh, we could not separate the pristular core phase from what's happening in the molecular cloud. So it's more complex for, for high mass star formation. But let's keep it simple and let's keep this scenario in, hand for, in, in mind for a moment. So we thought for the moment that, uh, we thought for long that the, the initial mass function, which is in fact the distribution of stars as a function of stellar masses, well, uh, piling up like, like a log normal with a power law, once again. And this is called the IMF. And when we were looking at core mass functions, so the same, the distribution of cores as a function of the core mass, 
we had a similar shape but offset it by a certain fraction that was called the efficiency of uh, gas mass transfer from cloud to star and uh, that was what we thought for long and uh, uh, we have to understand that these IMF and CMF are really two relations which are fundamental for many things, not only star formation, but also for uh, measuring star formation rates in galaxies and to perform galaxy and cosmological models because there are, there are uh, prescriptions that are used in the models. So that were uh, our, our beliefs from ground-based Herschel and near extinction surveys over two decades that really we found all the time the CMF which was looking like the AMF. So in that case, very simple, we have a one-to-one -one relation between a core and a star. The core is going to form a star or multiple at most. And uh, that uh, the, the IMF is defined at the core stage in the pre-stellar phase and that we can really uh, have a simple relation. That was the way we were thinking. But when you think about the uh, dynamical view, it's pose problem. And uh, behind this comparison between CMF and IMF, you have the to believe that the, the core mass that you're observing is the total mass available for a star, so no feeding from outside, no multiplicity, uh, that uh, uniform gas to star mass uh, conversion is, is uh, it's constant, while we know that alpha re regulated, but it, it also increases with density, so it's a difficulty. And we also have to believe that the lifetime is independent of the core mass, and that when we are observing CMF at one time, we really have the true CMF, and that we don't have to pile up several events of CMF to build a final CMF that will look like the AMF. So if you have a similarity between the CMF and IMF, then you have to think that there is a conspiracy and that uh, every effect here are cancelling out to have such a similar shape. Or you could say also that we have so uncertain in our measurement that in fact we don't see that the AMF is not universal and the CMF neither. And in fact, when you look in the W43MM1 ridge, which is a very, which is a starburst, mini starburst cluster, you see that uh, you have a CMF, uh, which is, uh, forget about this part because it's incomplete, but for the high mass part of the, of the CMF, it's flatter, much flatter than the IMF of stars, which is presented here. And you cannot really reconcile that with that just by taking the uncertainties. This is the gray zone here. So it tells you that either this region is going to be special with a top-heavy IMF, and in fact top-heavy IMF start to be observed, or that we have a complex relation between the CMF and, and the IMF. So I, I'm going to end up saying simply that uh, I recall you that uh, in ridges and hubs, the gas reservoir is not a single core, so doing this CMF is not well, it's interesting co to compare with low mass stuff in the region, but it's not something that is going to tell you anything about the IMF, really. You have an accretion cascade from very large scale to the small scales. Uh, the cores are going to be fed not only by, the, by, by their core size, by the core mass, but by outside, by intermediate gas inflows. And that in fact, low mass prisler cores uh, are going to form low mass protostars and then high mass protostars and then high mass stars. So it's really difficult to, to separate a prisler phase and, uh, and then the end of the phase and, and then the end of uh, the, the stars. Okay, that's the final thing for uh, part, that's a conclusion for part four, five. Uh, we tend to take cores as a uh, as mass reservoir to form stars, but you have to be careful about that. For long, the resemblance between the CMF and the IMF would suggest a direct relation between the core mass and the star mass. But in fact, we start to see in, in ridges, and in fact, in the ALMA-IMF large program, we see many more of this type uh, of uh, environment, which are dense, which are showing that uh, the CMF is really not looking like it was in the past. And that we have to understand how environment matters to define CMF and then the IMF. If you would have a question, that would be the last part anyway. Not for the moment. It was I pretty fast. I don't see anybody writing. Okay. So they, uh, I must say that there are a, a few more uh, technical questions that has been uh, asked, uh, but you, you 
uh, you will be able to answer either through Slack or uh, we will, uh, so some people are, are typing. So uh, I'm waiting for uh, them. So just to let you know that uh, um, just after this uh, sessions, uh, I will send a link uh, where you will be able to join Frederic for uh, a, a live discussion during uh, 10, 20 minutes uh, if you had more questions. Okay, so in that case, I will finish my talk with just this last slide, saying that uh, clouds and star forming regions are very mysterious still. And for me and for many of us, they are very exciting. We have plenty of things to understand still, and the physics behind is not well understood at all. Um, we tend to extrapolate the properties of the Milky Way clouds to, and the star formation relation to, uh, to extragalactic studies. We have to be careful because this is powerful but that's dangerous and uh, one must first constrain the wide variety of milky way clouds before we do that because for now most of the relations that are used in uh, extragalactic models for example are taken from uh, the global clouds uh, studies only so we need time but we will come to that then uh, the scaling relation uh, could come from uh, the hierarchical properties of clouds uh, but our observational uncertainties and our taste to universality, because that's always the case. In our, in our community, we like universal uh, relations, which we call low. Um, and they are hiding, uh, in fact, the dependence on galactic environment and probably the real physics. So, so we really have to work hard on this direction. Then as for uh, the tools that we're going to have to develop, in the future, we still have ALMA, hopefully NOEMA, and large radio surveys that are going to help. We are missing the successor of Herschel. Uh, we had speaker that was uh, died, <laughs> that died this year, which is too bad. But we have to work uh, as a community to, to revive something like, like it. And uh, I, I want also to, to draw your attention to the fact that observing is important, but uh, comparison with uh, simulation is also very important. And uh, simulations are not telling you the truth. You have to make them evolve, and that's uh, that's the goal of people like me. That's it. Thank you.